So the topic of this panel is disruptive technologies and copyright with a particular focus on the appropriate role of government in that equation. Uh, there's a, oh, actually I should start by saying I'm David Sohn with the Center for Democracy and, and Technology. I'm going to be moderating the panel. Um, as many in this room know, there's a, a long history of innovative technologies coming along and creating new ways to use and experience and distribute creative works. And the result, when those new technologies do come along, is often a lot of exciting opportunities. But at the same time, it can be fundamentally disruptive uh, and can raise a lot of serious questions for copyright. So as the new technologies come down the pike, it frequently prompts a debate over how or if either government or copyright law needs to respond to the new environment. Happened in the 20th century again and again, but just a few examples. You had the invention early in the century of the player piano, the advent of radio, cable TV, the VCR, more recent technologies have ranged from MP3 players to peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. And of course, more, more generally, the internet with both its great capability for wide-scale distribution and also its ability to serve as a platform for all different kinds of innovation. Uh, and the trend towards digitization, making all content digital, which makes it a lot easier to, mani to manipulate and use in different ways, but also, of course, much easier to copy. So the focus of the panel should be on how current technological innovations are posing challenges for the copyright regime and what kind of government response, if any, may be appropriate. Uh, we're very honored to have on our panel a member of the UK Parliament, Mr. Ian Taylor. He was first elected to Parliament in 1987 and has played a variety of technology policy roles, including the Minister for Science and Technology at the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, we're also happy to have, uh, going from my left, uh, the rest of the panel, Fritz Attaway, the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at the Motion Picture Association. He's been with MPA for many years and is a frequent commenter on all these issues. Jeffrey Eisenach, the Executive Vice President of the Cap Analysis Group. He's an economist and co-founder of the Progress and Freedom Foundation, and his resume includes stints in government at the FTC and the OMB. Uh, to his left, Jason Krikorian is co-founder, CFO, and VP of Sling Media, which sells a device called the Sling Box, which can transmit your home television signals to your mobile laptop when you happen to be on the road. Uh, and then finally, Gigi Sohn, uh, no relation to me, despite the identical last name. Uh, she is president and founder of Public Knowledge, which is a nonprofit public interest group that focuses on intellectual property and communications policy. Um, I think we'll start briefly by hearing from each of the panelists. I'd like to ask them to keep their initial remarks to three minutes or so, so that we'll have time for more interactive discussion. I'd like to also have some time at the end for questions from the audience. Um, Mr. Taylor, maybe you could start us off. As, as a legislator, uh, how do you evaluate what government role there should be uh, in this area? And, and also you could talk on what are the hot issues in the UK concerning the intersection of copyright and technology. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, let's start by uh, recognizing something rather important, and I used to be Minister of Science and Technology, as you said, and that included intellectual property and copyright, as it happens. And that was in the mid-1990s. Uh, and one of the things I said to the recording industry and the film industry in the UK was, uh, you are going to have to change your business model, otherwise you're under threat. And most of them, including EMI, by the way, said, no, no we're all right, we've got a great library, we've, we've got back issues, people will always need us. And I said, just Remember that once bandwidth grows, people will want to download, and they won't go into the little music store, or they won't necessarily buy in the way that uh, they're traditionally done. So whereas governments have previously been delighted to regulate copyright in the interests of the content provider owner, and there are plenty of governments that talk about this context, not only the national government, the UK and my case, of course, but the European Union, the United States, but also the World Intellectual Property Organization, many others uh, have been looking at this. That really doesn't work in the modern age. And I think you have to start from the other end and say, what does the consumer want? What is the consumer experience? What does the consumer expect? And then, as we've been taking some hearings in the UK Parliament in, uh, in the last few weeks, you begin to get in some really interesting areas. There is, uh, in, in law, no private copying exemption. So in actual in fact, in the UK current law, you can't copy. Uh, now, um, it's interesting because the CEO of the Recording Industry Association of America noted that 12% of households burn CDs and 37% of that group burn six or more CDs. Now, if that were under UK law, that would be illegal. 
But are we really saying that we're going now to try to stop the consumers doing what they think they want to do? The second thing is that people have more than one gadget and they expect to be able to transfer it. Now, uh, the challenge, therefore, is not so much for government, but industry. Industry has been very slow at recognizing this. Uh, it's now bringing in DRM, digital rights management, or, or more accurately, uh, management of digital rights, allied with technical protection measures. If the consumer doesn't really understand what that's trying to do, then the consumer will react badly. And the interesting thing is the vulnerability of the current incumbents in this industry is quite considerable because if there were to be a consumer reaction, then they find themselves bypassed. In the UK, we have a group called the Arctic Monkeys that has been distributing its uh, uh, singles pop music over the internet for free, uh, and now it's bought out a proper CD and it's selling very well, but it's actually independent of the big majors. And I noticed in this morning's paper, downloads make singles a hit again. That's in the Washington Post. It's distorting the market model. What the government has to try to do then is only intervene when there are abuses either by industry against the consumer, fair use I suppose in Rick Boucher's context, or where there are knowledge in the marketplace such as how, uh, as we heard from the British Library, how libraries could be affected if DRM technology prevented them getting access to material uh, and using it in the way that libraries have traditionally done. So I'll stop there. The consumer is king, industry watch out, and the really successful companies will be the ones that change their business model to cope with the fact that the consumer wants to copy, transfer, and multi-use material. Great, thanks. Well, let's turn to Fritz Attaway next. Maybe you could give us a brief sketch of where the MPAA is focusing its Capitol Hill advocacy on these issues and why. Well, I certainly agree with Mr. Taylor that consumer is king. Uh, there's no question about that, and uh, I would take issue uh, with you about the purpose of the copyright law. I don't think that the copyright law is totally uh, 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 used to serve the interest of copyright owners. It is used to stimulate creativity for the general public interest. Uh, certainly, that is the purpose of the copyright clause in the United States Constitution. Now, what is the role of government? I think that uh, uh, they got it right in the, the description of this panel. It is finding the right balance between market solutions, consumer expectations, and government intervention. Uh, in most cases, I think that the proper solution should be a marketplace solution. However, there are circumstances where market solutions just don't work. And uh, most of you know what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the broadcast flag and the analog hole. Uh, the broadcast flag, uh, I, I just read something this morning. I, I think it was a quote of, of Larry Lessig stating that the, the, the broadcast flag is this abomination that's going to interfere with all consumer devices. Well, 80% of the channels that most people receive are received through conditional access systems like cable and satellite. All of that programming is going to be protected from uh, redistribution over the internet. The broadcast flag simply puts broadcasters on a level playing field. And I think the public interest that they be able to receive high quality content over free over the air broadcasting, not just on cable and satellite. Now, the analog hole is the same kind of situation. Uh, we could deal with the analog hole through a purely marketplace solution. That would be to require high value content only to be passed through digital connections. Of course, that would mean that the 80 or 90 percent of people in this country that don't have digital television sets couldn't see it, and that is not in their interest and it's not in our interest. So we believe that the analog hole is an appropriate issue for government to take up. It is short term. It will only exist during this transition from analog to digital. But during that transition, it is essential uh, for consumers to be able to access high quality content on their old analog television sets. 
and it is essential for us that that access be done in a secure way. The analog hole legislation that has been introduced is uh, the only way we know of to do it. If someone's got a better idea, uh, we're certainly open to suggestions, but I think that is the only way to do it. Uh, thanks. Mr. Eisenach, as an economist, maybe you could offer some perspective on the disruptiveness of today's uh, technology. Well, I certainly do that. Um, and let me begin in the interest of full disclosure, which is important in the modern environment. Uh, I've got a number of clients, a bunch of them in this room, uh, who uh, I work on uh, a variety of issues for involving the Internet and public policy. Um, one of them is the Recording Industry Association of America, and the issue that I'm going to talk about today is what I'm working with RIAA on, so um, you take my views for, uh, for what they're worth in that context. The, um, the, the issue here that's affecting all of these issues that has been so disruptive in terms of copyright is the digitization of everything and the convergence of all digital media so that it's now possible to get you know, virtually any uh, content from books to movies uh, to electronic games over uh, virtually any digital delivery device. So that's, that's been um, uh, affected copyright issues in a lot of different ways. Um, and all of these devices are increasingly compatible. Once you digitize content, uh, once you get it on your cell phone in the form of an MP3 file, it's in principle transferable to any other uh, digital device. So the ability to gather and collect and then move digital media around is, is uh, exploded. And that's a fabulous thing. Uh, I've got iTunes loaded up on my media center at home, and it's the uh, best thing that ever happened as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, so that is wonderful. But, that, but these changes have um, created some problems, and they're, they're in the nature of property rights problems. Um, I think everybody has followed closely what happened with B2P piracy. Um, and what I think people are beginning to follow now is the potential for a new technology digital radio to repeat the same kinds of problems. Um, the problems are similar in the following sense. What, what P2P allowed people to do was to uh, essentially download media music for free uh, by uh, loading it onto one of the P2P servers, uh, on a P2P service on their own computer and then having that accessible anywhere. And, um, and thereby prevented uh, the folks who made that music and distributed that music from getting any return on it. Um, that issue is similar in the, HD radio, in, the, in the HD radio or digital radio environment because the devices that are now coming on the market are devices that you can program to record any songs off the digital radio stream that you want in principle. Technology would allow you to do that. You don't have to listen to the music. It's not like what you do or we all grew up doing, which is sit by the radio and wait for the song to come on or maybe know that a program is going to be on with the Grateful Dead and you sit and record the 45 minutes of the dead. Uh, but rather the ability to program a computer over the course of a week, if you go to Frank's Place, for example, which I listen to a lot on XM Radio, say record the following Sinatra uh, album of uh, songs and put them in the following order. Uh, never touch the thing again and you come back after a day or a week or a month and you will have that album and will not have paid a penny for it. That's obviously a problem and I think the notion that people wouldn't utilize that given the experience we had with P2P would be, would be naive. But there's a difference. The difference is in the P2P environment there were property rights, right? P people were, as it turned out, and the courts have litigated this, people were violating the law uh, when they shared music in that way and uh, that's now been litigated and there was a lot of controversy over the cost of enforcing the law against people who were violating it in that way. It was a pretty controversial topic from the DMCA on. Uh, but at the end of the day, it proved possible to litigate against this. And uh, that probably has had some significant impact. In the HD radio environment, there are no property rights. And the reason is, there's a legacy rule that if you're a broadcast radio station, you don't pay either the artist or the distributor, uh, the record company, for playing the music. Um, the record company's got no property rights, no ability whatsoever to say, don't distribute my music unless you do it with a certain kind of DRM technology or under certain conditions or pay me money. Uh, and uh, that was a, a compromise reached a long time ago, probably made sense in a world in which people were listening to the radio. Uh, but what we're talking about with digital radio is not listening to the radio. We're talking about compiling libraries of music. Uh, what are the solutions? There, there are two solutions. One solution, and the preferred one, is to create property rights. Right? If, if there were property rights, if the, rec if, the, if the artists and the recording companies had property rights over uh, this music, they'd work out a deal. They've done that in other contexts. Uh, and so the preferred solution would be negotiated solutions. 
and you probably have a variety of them. The market would develop efficient ways of, of compensating people for that, techno for that use of that music. Um, the alternative, because there aren't property rights and, and getting property rights is a, a, a Herculean legislative task, uh, the alternative is to have the government step in with some form of, of regulated solution and the, and the preferred one there is some form of audio flag uh, that would, as the broad, broadcast flag would in the uh, video world, prevent, in this case, just the librarying of music, not the recording of music. Nobody's saying you can't push a button and record the song as it comes over the radio or for that matter as you can today, set the timer on your recorder and say record everything from 9 to 10 and such and such a channel. Everything you can do today would be preserved. Uh, but what would be prevented is the ability to essentially replace P2P piracy with digital radio piracy. Um, those, are, those are the solutions that seem to be available. I think uh, you know, people are, are who understand the problem as they come to understand the problem realize that the lack of property rights here really does require some sort of action, and, uh, and I suspect that will probably take place soon with uh, a lot of people in this room having a part in that. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Kikorian, if you could tell the audience a little bit about your company and the copyright issues that it faces. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's, it's actually a real pleasure uh, to come across the country. Just by way of c context, how many people have heard of what the Slingbox is? Oh, that's great. Okay. Marketing dollars are paying off. Um, just for those of you who don't know, I'll be quick without making a commercial, so you have context. Uh, this is a device that allows you to watch your living room television programming wherever you happen to be. So we sell it at consumer product stores like Best Buy. You take it home, you plug whatever television source uh, that you have, cable, satellite, whatever you'd like, uh, into this box via analog inputs in the back of it. Then you connect it to your network, and then you're able to watch and control that TiVo, that cable box, that Echo Star box, what have you, from anywhere in the world. On your PC or on your mobile phone now, which we just launched, uh, excuse me, announced um, a Windows mobile version. Um, so you know, there, there are obviously some, some, some issues um, that people have brought up around some copyright um, related issues, but it's very clear that, just to make it, to make it clear, um, we've done several things to make this as respectful of a device for copyright holders as possible. And most specifically, um, we've got a username and password, which of course is transmitted encrypted over the network. Um, most importantly, uh, there's no copying. And in addition to that, only one, sling, only one receiver client, that is, can access the sling box at a time. So this is not a one-to-many mass distribution tool for indiscriminate uh, redistribution, which is the subject of a lot of the, the bills and the drafts that I've read. Uh, my role on the panel, I think, is as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, most importantly, when I read about the, the bills as they come across the newswire, the thing that scares me most, actually, is um, building a business plan and on page one of that business plan, it being seek FCC approval, right? And I, I can't imagine and let me explain, if you bring this to a VC and that's page one, it's hard enough getting them to invest in consumer products, consumer electronics. If I have to involve a government bureaucracy to even get off, get off the ground, it's never going to happen. And it's really going to curb innovation. So that's where, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I think there's a question about whether government intervention is even required in this space. I think uh, the government uh, and, and the court, through the court systems and things like fair use, and now most recently the Grokster case, which might modify the, the Sony doctrine a bit, provide the content owners with plenty of tools at their disposal to, again, target the thing that is the, is the purpose of these bills, which is indiscriminate redistribution. Um, but it's also true that the marketplace does work these things out. You mentioned um, iTunes, right? And that's say, you know, what we've come across through that is Apple's put forth their Fair Play uh, DRM, which I, you know, I can tell you tens of consumer electronics companies that would love to put Fair Play DRM in consumer electronics if you know, jobs would let them. That's a separate issue altogether. But um, the biggest issue to me is as we see these bills come through, um, the most important thing is that Congress needs to think about where that line is drawn. And there are certain consumer behaviors that are consumer activities that are reasonable to be expected. And some of the things that, uh, some of the activities that have been allowed um, by the courts through well-shaped fair use doctrine um, need to be reflected in that. And I, you start to see some of that in some of the bills. Things like TiVo or time-shifting applications 
are implicitly reflected, and I think that's great, because I think largely congressmen have had the opportunity to play with the device. They know they like it. They feel like, hey, this is something that should be done. Um, so that's terrific. But what I'm concerned about is the applications that come across over the next 24 months and the things that congressmen haven't really played with and they don't really understand. And unless we really carve out explicitly in bills the room for such, such expansion, the consumers and the technology industry and, and the U.S. economy are really going to suffer. Um, and this includes things, as I read the analog whole bill in particular, there's something just implicitly rigid and not flexible about legislation that can be problematic and is much better handing in, in, a, in a common law approach. Things like <clears throat> the concept of premium content. I don't, I don't really know what that is. Uh, I don't know what VOD is, uh, pay-per-view. Things are changing already. Some of the, uh, the paradigms laid out in these bills that relate to certain things being covered, like premium content versus non-premium content, that stuff's breaking down. If I, have, if I watch CSI in the, linear, in the linear programming set on CBS on whatever channel it airs, that might be non-premium programming, but perhaps if I download it for 99 cents from Comcast three days later, then it becomes premium programming. There's just a, ma a matter of rigidity that I think um, is better left outside the government. Great, thanks. And uh, finally, Gigi Sohn. Um, since you're representing the public interest group here, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you perceive the public's stake in these debates. Well, let me ask a question first. Who went to the Consumer Electronics Show? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, I, unfortunately, I'm a first-time mother, as a lot of you know, so I didn't get a chance to go this year. But thanks to my colleagues who wrote just a terrific blog, kind of gave me a blow-by-blow -blow description of what was going on. And what was remarkable about the Consumer Electronics Show were two things. The first thing was just the no unbelievable number of devices like those from Sling Media, uh, from ya software from Yahoo and Microsoft, uh, a whole raft of gadgets and software that allow consumers to watch what they want to watch, when they want to watch it. So that was, the gadgets were amazing, and, I'm, and, and this is going to be the last year I'm going to miss it for quite some time. The second thing that was amazing was I had been uh, to CES, I think, the previous three years, and I saw no significant presence from the content industry. But this year, the content industry showed up, and they showed up big time. And they were cutting deals left and right. I mean, you know, CES doesn't include Apple, so let's you know, even set aside all the deals with iTunes and how, mu how many people, millions and millions of people, are, are paying $1.99 to watch old reruns of television shows. But this was the year that the content industry showed up at CES. They cut deals, and that says to me the market is working. People are buying legally, they're buying legal music, they're buying legal video. Uh, they're buying these devices. They're buying digital television sets in droves. I mean, one of the arguments for the broadcast flag was that, you know, people would not buy high-definition television sets because content owners wouldn't put high-value content on television. That's just not true. Number one, most of the primetime schedules are all in high-def, and the high-def television sets are flying off the shelves. So in my mind... The marketplace is absolutely working. Consumers, the public, are getting exactly what they want and doing what they want to do with it. And, you know, some of that content is protected. And when it's protected too much, like the Sony rootkit situation, consumers complain. And guess what? Sony stopped using that rootkit. But when it's, you know, when the digital rights management formulated in the marketplace gives consumers flexibility and is reasonable, like fair play, people accept it. So I ask this audience, why do we need the government? I am I'm absolutely flummoxed and puzzled why we need, to, we need the government where the marketplace is very, very robust and consumers are getting what they want, content providers are making money hand over fist, and the consumer electronics and tech industry are doing great. Why are we not all happy? Well, unfortunately, that's not good enough for the motion picture and recording industry. And I have to tell you how disappointed. I don't want to be too personal, but to hear somebody, co-founder of the Progress of Freedom Foundation, uh, argue for a radio flag is just, I just find that extraordinarily disappointing. But I'll, I'll talk about that more in detail. So what's the problem with, with government tech mandates? First and foremost, it injects government into technological design. Who is worst to decide how Jason should build his machines on the government. Now, I'm not anti-government. 
There's some things they do well. This is not one of them. The second thing is, from a consumer perspective, it limits lawful uses. Okay, not all lawful uses, but some. All right, and if you have a one-size-fits-all strategy, you know, and, and of course you have the Millennium Copyright Act, which says you can't circumvent DRM for lawful uses. It's going to limit lawful uses. I'll talk about a couple of them in just a second. And the third, and, and, and Fritz and his colleagues dismiss this, but it's not dismissible. The broadcast flag particularly, and a lot of these schemes, these government mandated schemes, cause interoperability problems, machines don't work with each other, and that just raises consumers' costs to the max. And, I, and as I said before, it's just not necessary. So let me just say a, a few words of, about the broadcast flag and also about radio content protection uh, and the analog hole, and then I will just close. You know, the broadcast flag has been, from the very beginning, touted as a very narrow solution to a major problem. Well, first of all, I don't think the content industry has ever proved the problem. In the FCC rulemaking, they did not show even one instance of high-definition television being, you know, redistrib redistributed willy-nilly over the Internet. That would be really hard because those files are huge. All right, so we can talk about whether there's a problem or not. They haven't proved it. But beside the fact, that fact, the broadcast flag doesn't just stop indiscriminate redistribution. It stops any redistribution. So if I'm the Parents Television Council or Media Matters, so let me use a more, uh, a more recent example that was in the New York Times, I think, on Monday. People were taking the advertisements from the Super Bowl and putting them on their blog. Yeah, I get it, Tim. Thanks. Um, putting them on their blog and criticizing them. All right? With the broadcast flag, you could not do that. All right? You would not be able to do that. Parents Television Council, conservative you know, media critic, they wouldn't be able to take their favorite shows or their least favorite shows and post them for people to criticize themselves. So it's more than indiscriminate redistribution. Very quickly. On the radio content protection, this one's an easy one. This is a fight, and Jeff made the case. This is a fight over licensing. Let's have that discussion. Should broadcasters, you know, not have to pay performance royalties? I think that's a very, very legitimate question to ask. But that's not the issue here. Okay, the issue here is, do you, would you rather have a government tech mandate or would you rather deal with the licensing issue? I think we should deal with the licensing issue. I think that's a very robust debate. I think you can make a strong argument for platform parity, but don't get the government involved in stopping what, under the Audio Home Recording Act, is legal. Okay, by law, the public is allowed to record radio transmissions. Finally, on the, I won't say any more about the analog hole other than it is tech mandate to end all tech mandates, and we can talk more specifically later. All right, well, thanks. Um, since Gigi ran over time probably a little bit, I think I should allow some rebuttal time. Fred? If, if I may start. Uh, Gigi and I have had this debate many, many times, and I just don't seem to be able to make her see the light. I hope I do better with uh, the audience. Uh, the broadcast flag issue is not about interoperability. It's not about whether people can post their favorite show uh, on their website. Uh, whether these issues, these, if these issues exist, uh, they will be problems for the vast majority of people who receive their content over conditional access systems like cable and satellite, and they're going to have to deal with those problems. The broadcast flag issue is whether broadcasters should be on a level playing field with cable and satellite. That is the issue. And I submit that they should be. There is an overwhelming public interest in free, over-the-air broadcasting, and government has not only the right but the duty to facilitate the acquisition of high-value content by over-the-air broadcasters and uh, create conditions where it does not all migrate to uh, pay systems like cable and satellite. Uh, secondly, uh, with regard to uh, the, the analog hole, I agree with Gigi that the, our mantra is what they want when they want it for consumers. That's what we're trying to do. But I ask you, if we are trying to provide consumers with high quality content when they want it, at a very low price, and for a viewing option, and we want to charge $1.99 for a download, but 
by exploiting the analog hole, some consumers can take that very rice content, make endless copies, and upload it to the internet. How can we do that? We can't. Government needs to step in and help create the conditions where we can provide consumers what they want, when they want it, at reasonable prices. That's what this is all about. Sure. I maybe do a little rebuttal myself. Um, the, um, uh, so I, I guess on behalf of RIA and Friends of Property Rights Everywhere, I want to thank Gigi for the endorsement of uh, a really important concept, and that is the notion there ought to be property rights for audio content when it's played over the air on the radio. Um, and that would be, you know, I think by everybody's kind of preferred outcome. Um, that, incidentally, Gigi has been the principle that's guided PFF, um, all of the work the Progress and Freedom Foundation has done, which is that, that markets simply won't function if property rights don't exist and can't be enforced. And um, uh, I, think, I think to the extent you imply there's some inconsistency, there's not. The, um, in, in the real world, um, there's a timing issue. Um, I think it's likely that performance rights parity will be the legislative outcome over time. Uh, I'm not sure it's clear that performance rights parity in, in the real world, as a practical matter, is going to be the outcome anytime very soon. And it's simply because every one in this room who works on Capitol Hill has got a constituent, a number of constituents running run radio stations and broadcast TV stations in their districts. And um, the right thing may be to apply on a performance right, but the practical thing is going to involve overcoming. Uh, a you know, very firm resistance from all of those constituents. Um, so in, in the interim, the question is, what can government do to approximate, to approximate, oh, sorry. To approximate, uh, you know, what a market outcome would be. Well, how did we get to the fair play outcome? We got to the fair play outcome because you did have property rights in uh, the digital download environment. Uh, I, uh, Apple couldn't just start iTunes and start giving it away for free or charging 10 cents and paying nobody a copyright. They had to negotiate with content owners and come up with a DRM solution that worked for everyone. Um, government can get to that solution and it can get to that solution not by imposing an arbitrary technology standard but by bringing the players together in a room uh, and saying you all have got to come up with a solution that works and that's, that's not as good as if you just have property rights. Uh, but it's better than just walking away from the problem. Walking, the, walking away from the problem is creating a legacy uh, that's going to be very difficult to solve two or three years from now. Uh, if we allow millions, millions of digital devices to be distributed and people to get in the habit of believing that with government sanction they can create for free libraries of digital music, uh, that's going to be, I think, an even more difficult uh, challenge. Um, pe people in high school today grew up thinking that music was free on the Internet. And it's cost millions of dollars and a lot of pain and agony to begin reversing that perception. Uh, so let me we, break in and, and, go ahead. And, and sort of try to move things up to a, just a slightly higher level. So, so, so there's a number of, of proposals that have been floated for ways that, that government should possibly get involved. And I guess what I'd like to ask the panel is how policymakers looking at those proposals should try to evaluate uh, you know, both the costs and the benefits and the need for the legislation. Um, Gigi had suggested that, that it hasn't been proved that, that there's a problem. And I guess one, one question that policymakers may face is at, at, at what stage do we decide that government does need to get involved? Do we wait for there to be a, a demonstrated actual problem where rates of piracy uh, are already high and proven? Or should government try to look at what seem to be reasonably foreseeable consequences of the way the technology is going, project out a little bit, and try to address a problem before it gets large and out of control? David, can I just, there's something missing from this conversation, and that's the fact that there are very strong copyright laws in this country. Okay, you ask what government can do, and what government does as well is it enforces the copyright laws in this country. So when somebody is engaging in widespread copyright infringement, the government goes after them, and, and the companies go after them. So, you know, when we say what can go, it's not like government has no tools. The question is what are appropriate tools, what are the tools that will not stifle innovation and will ensure that consumers have as much rights as they're entitled to. And it's not technological mandates, in my opinion. Mr. Taylor, can we? I just don't think that applies to, I mean, just very briefly, I just don't think that applies to HD radio. Why? I, I, because, because it is not at all clear which law is being violated by these devices. 
I mean, you have you have I a work. Any laws being violated by these devices? Uh, so people so have a right. So there are no tools. First of all, on satellite, Thank Jeff, in satellite radio, you can't even take the your library off of that off of the digital device. Okay, so where are people sending it to? It's not about. I mean, I'll give the broadcast bag at least some credit. At least it's trying to be about indiscriminate redistribution. The radio flag, which, by the way, doesn't exist in real life, is just about preventing people from copying. And they have a legal right no, to it, do that. That's, no, that's just not true. The, the audio flag is about preventing people from library. It would not prevent people from doing everything that they do today. It would prevent the programmability function that allows you to search everything on the digital airwaves over a period of time and come up with the Sinatra album that you'd otherwise pay 99 cents a song. Let's try to get Mr. Taylor in on this question. Well, I listened to this animated debate with interest. I can tell you as a legislator, I've heard these debates before, and I think that any sensible legislator stands back and just lets them get on with it. You uh, <laughs> You, you try and legislate sensibly from the tit-for-tat comments we've just heard and you won't get anywhere. Anyway, by the time you've legislated, technology will move on. Let me ask just a question and then I'll leave it open for the floor. What do you mean by broadcast anyway in this modern age? Who actually sits down and watches a television if you're younger? I mean, we're in a different age. People information audio, visual, whatever, on any, any device that they get. We're moving into a mobile phone area where you will be able to get streamed video. I mean, for goodness sake, from a legislator point of view, listen to the argument and step well back and let them fight it out. And if this means that some of the incumbents are damaged, that means that the incumbents aren't very intelligent. Well, let me ask also then about uh, as, as, as policymakers look at these various proposals, obviously one of the things they're going to have to think about are what are the costs or downsides of them. Gigi mentioned that there could be some, um, some impacts on fair use. Mr. Kikorian, do you have anything to say about sort of how, how you think any of these proposals would potentially affect a, a technology like yours, say the, the analog hole legislation, or, yeah. or the ability of your company to uh, consider new kinds of, pro of, of products in the future? Yeah, I mean, and I, I hinted at it before. I, I think the biggest impact that it would have, and I think about these issues less as sling media, to be honest. In, in some parts, I have a product, but I'll have future products as well. So I just I think about it from the perspective of an entrepreneur and creating products. And if I don't have flexibility and uh, some at least ability to self-certify and make a case that this is a reasonable activity to do whatever it is, my next product, whatever, and instead I have to uh, drive through some government certification process prior to getting anything off the ground, I'm afraid that that process will take too long, it'll be too costly for, and, and costly from the perspective of an entrepreneur is thousands of dollars, right? This is very different. We're not talking about millions or billions of dollars in infrastructure or process costs. Um, so it will it takes take too long, so uh, an individual sitting in his garage won't be able to get that product out of the shelf, or it will result in a watered-down, really non-compelling application, which is put together or cut down in order to you know, push it through the process. And what I also, you, you make a good point, or ask a good question, David, which is you know, how long do you wait if you are going to implement things? Um, I also would argue that you know, to the extent that action needs to be taken, and Congress feels compelled to put technical mandates, it's also very important to ask the questions, how long do you wait to create carve-outs? Right? And I think any, any type of, of legislation needs to come with meaningful and flexible freedoms within it. And you know, as, a, as a case, on the plane last night, I was reading through the analog hold bill again. There are some, right? There are some very specific carve-outs, such as you know, distributing a, a piece of content um, to one's boat. Okay, that's terrific. That's very specific. I'm sure someone who wrote that has a boat, but it, it's, meaning, it's meaningless in the long run. And so something that, that encompasses the concept of fair use, however it may be modified by Grokster, um, that needs to be put in here in, into these things. And I, I listened this morning to um, Senator Boucher, Congressman Boucher, on, um, on, on his fair use bill, and it, it 
I'm a, I'm a DC outsider, so forgive me, but it, it, does, it strikes me as something like that really needs to be put in some of these bills, right? Um, in any case, I think we need to think about the balance um, if any action is to be taken. Uh, thanks. Let me, let me touch on the, the interoperability question, which I think has been, has been brought up a couple times. Um, certainly, technical copy protection schemes can have some impact on the interoperability of different devices, and I think you see it in digital music right now, where if you buy songs on iTunes, for example, it won't play on non-Apple portable music players. Looking ahead, what are, what are consumers likely to face? Are they going to face a, a much more complicated media world where lots of things don't work together because there are different um, copying restrictions on them? Or, or do you think that a lot of those interoperability issues will get resolved over time? And is that process something that government has any role in? I think the government can, can enforce. Uh, I mean, we've had interoperability problems with technologies in the past. And ultimately, it's not always the best technology that wins. It's the one that the consumer is either most familiar with or, or, or is recognizes is, is the base on which you want it to build. So I think Apple has, has made a stride in the marketplace. Uh, how they develop it from there is, is a commercial model, which I will watch closely. But I don't think I want to legislate for it. And ultimately, people, if people don't like something, they, they will vote with their feet, as we always used to say. In this case, their pocketbooks. <laughs> and they will force a change in the market. Uh, and at the moment, I think you saw from the reports from the consumer exhibition, people are circling and trying to work out how to how to move from this stage to the next, or even better, commercially, to the one after the next, because things are moving so quickly. Yeah. Let, let, let me comment on this. Um, what Mr. Taylor said earlier, and he, he raised the issue of the, the intelligence level of the various players in the debate. Um, I find legislators uh, extraordinarily intelligent, but not, not always extraordinarily well informed, which is why I think the Internet Education Foundation is such an important thing, and I, I served on the board here for a while, so I think it's a great thing. Um, let me try and let me try and give an analogy that may make it simpler. Mr. Taylor may be to understand this. Imagine Mr. Taylor in the, in the UK, a burster showed up one day, wrote an article in the paper, a law review article, and, it dis and discovered that for reasons uh, inexplicable, uh, that the laws applying to theft and shoplifting didn't apply to warehouses. Somehow that had been missed. And as a result, retailers uh, began showing up at warehouses, sometimes with gangs of guys, sometimes at night, and taking large quantities of products, TVs and radios and CDs and so on and so forth, out of those warehouses. There were no property rights. The owners of the warehouses, the owners of the products, had no recourse. You would not say to those people, work it out. They'd be, they'd be in front of you. Warehouse owners would be saying, we're get, people are stealing our stuff here. And the retailers would be saying, oh, no, this is fair. There's no law. If they'd intended there to be a law, you know you'd be lobbied. Right? That's what's going on here. There are no property rights. It is a fundamental role of government from Ian Rand and, and, and to the right from time immemorial to define and enforce property rights and to say, oh, we're just going to stay out of the way. It's just fundamentally it's either ill-informed or irresponsible. Well, but there's, there's a fundamental assumption, uh, incorrect assumption, is that people making legitimate copies as they are permitted under the law. There is a law here. It's called the Audio Home Recording Act. And it says that, that consumers, the public, have a right to make copies of, of radio transmissions, both digital and analog. Okay, so there's, there's not stealing here. And, uh, and you know, Jeff, I don't buy into your vision of property rights when it comes to copyright. Okay, you, you know I don't. You know it's not the same thing. But be that as it may, you know, you're absolutely wrong. There is a law. The problem your clients have is that the law favors consumers. It's one of the few in the Copyright Act that actually favors consumers' rights as opposed to the rights of large publishing companies. You don't, you don't disagree that if there was a performance right, which I understood you to at least contemplate endorsing, uh, that we would get a workout of some sort that probably looks, may not look much like fair play, but it would be some sort of workout that all the parties could, could live with. And, 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 and are you saying that would be unfair to consumers relative to, I mean, do... do no, I, think, I think having what, the discussion the about the licensing, the licensing concerns is something that I know uh, that the, the smart staffers on the Hill are looking at, and it's, it's a conversation that should be had before, before we have any conversation about the tech mandates. Because as far as I'm concerned, the radio flag, radio content protection, radio encryption, it changes almost every week. Uh, that is not about 
people unlawfully redistrib redistributing uh, your content over the internet. It's not about peer-to-peer. -peer. It's about the fact that the recording industry feels screwed because they're not, they don't feel like they're getting their full complement of, of, of royalties. And I think, I, I think there should be a conversation. And I agree with Mr. Taylor is that, I guess, and, and, and disagree, unfortunately, once again, again with my friend Fritz Attaway, broadcast, cable, who cares about the distinctions anymore? I mean, please don't talk to me about you know, all the benefits of free over-the-air broadcasting. Okay, free over-the-air broadcasting is, is going to be different. You know, you know, do you want parity or you don't want parity? I mean, uh, to me, it's indistinguishable. Uh, and, I'm going to have to. Uh, and, and, and please don't, so please don't talk to me about the great joys of free over-the-air broadcasting. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. So, so we've established that, that Gigi doesn't care about free over-the-air broadcasting. But let me, <laughs> let me ask you a question, Gigi. Uh, cable and satellite content will be protected, is being protected against indiscriminate redistribution. Do you believe that, uh, and you think that's a terrible thing for over the air broadcasters to do that, do you think government should step in and pass a law that says that uh, device manufacturers must allow the indiscriminate redistribution of cable and satellite programming? Well, I'm not, I can't say I'm crazy about, you know, uh, the deals that you know that have been struck in the in the cable areas and the multi-channel video areas, but it was done without government action, and 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 Jason had a, a, a perfect point, and this is the other big problem I have with the broadcast flag, is that there's a government certification process that innovators have to look at and VC look at and say why do I want to you know why do I want to fund you if you have to go through this process, and, and that's another issue. I mean, if you want to talk about fixing. Uh, what's wrong with the broadcast flag legislation, I think you have to look at two things. You have to look at whether there should be exceptions for things like news and public affairs programming. I see absolutely no rationale for flagging that kind of programming. I mean, if you want to make the case that broadcasting is different, and this is the essential point that people should get, yeah, okay. And, and, and the second thing you have to look, and also Teach Act distance learning should be exempted. The second thing you have to look at is making the FCC's process more transparent, which is something that CDT has talked a lot about. Well, now you're asking government to, to draw distinctions between one type of programming and another type of programming. And, and something Jason said earlier is something I, I totally agree with. Uh, it, it, it's very difficult for government to start drawing distinctions between different types of programming. And Jason, I wish you were there when the FCC adopted the encoding rules in its P2P proceeding that we uh, vehemently opposed, but uh, they imposed those rules anyway. So I'd agree with you on that. Tim, do we have time for one more or should we wrap up? Sounds like we are out of time. Um, so just everybody please thank our panelists. Uh, thanks for coming.